This lecture begins Unit 2, where we'll discuss the profession of architecture. Today we're going to be talking about architects in popular culture and how they're portrayed in the media. Later we'll be discussing what it is that architects do, how you become an architect, and the responsibilities of being an architect. But today we'll look at the media portray portrayal of architects and specifically how we're influenced by what the media shows in terms of architecture as a profession and architects as uh, people and what they do and what their culture is. Now the reason why we look at this is because architects tend to be overrepresented in the media and in popular culture and underrepresented in reality. So in reality the American Institute of Architects estimates that there are currently 105,847 registered architects in the United States. Now that represents about three one hundredths percent of the US population. So the US population is just under 319 million people and so just over a hundred thousand of those are architects and many people believe they know exactly what architects do and it can't be because all of them personally know an architect and so unwittingly we're probably really influenced by the things that we see in the portrayal of architects either in movies or books or TV and so we're going to take a look at that. And what we'll look at is kind of some archetypes that are laid out in the media and I've I'm showing five different archetypes and by archetype I just mean you know what is kind of the category of architect that the media tends to portray and these are in no particular order of importance but the star architect is the first one that we'll look at and some of these mimic reality and what has happened in the last few decades is as the media has become more prevalent and more prolific in our lives, the rise of the star architect has come with that. And by star architect, we mean someone who is famous for being an architect, who is also an architect and does uh, lots of projects and um, is well known. Now, some people would argue that the first uh, star architect might have been Frank Lloyd Wright and was very good at um, marketing himself and his status as an architect. Um, there were other modernist architects who kind of came along in the middle part of the 20th century who were famous. Uh, Le Corbusier, uh, Mies van der Rohe, some other modernists um, fall into that category. Philip Johnson could be considered a star architect also. But you know in more recent popular culture because of the notoriety that some buildings have gotten some people would say perhaps Frank Gehry is the first star architect. We talked a bit about that in previous lecture about the Bilbao effect and because people generally agreed that they liked the Bilbao uh, Museum, the Guggenheim in Bilbao, that uh, that was worthy of press and notoriety and uh, you know an architect was famous for being an architect and not just some fictional portrayal in the media but an actual architect. So when we look at this we kind of look at its roots in some forms of popular culture. So the first example of this is The Fountainhead. And The Fountainhead was a novel by Ayn Rand that came out in 1943. And some people might be familiar with The Fountainhead as something you were required to read in high school or perhaps college, but it is about 
an architect and his name is Howard Rourke and Howard Rourke is has a really singular vision for what he thinks is appropriate and ex acceptable architecture and he is kind of famous or infamous for bucking the trends of the time and being quite aggressive about his opinions um, but the main thrust of this book is that he is on his own that he is the only one drawing designing creating uh, these works he is casting off old ideas of classical architecture he is uh, essentially a modernist and he doesn't care what anybody else thinks now that is kind of a stylized or idealized version of you know what a creative person might potentially be kind of a creative crusader type but in reality architecture is highly collaborative and typically you're working on teams and even if you're a designer you're working as part of a design team and often even you know the star architects that we see today are people who kind of uh, gain media attention have huge teams of architects and people working with them and collaborating with them to bring their ideas to fruition so the fountainhead in some ways it's not really even about architecture it's about uh, you know your ideals and staying true to your ideals and it's kind of portrayed through the um, life and career of, of this architect Howard Rourke now I think most or maybe not most but some people now would uh, agree that they wouldn't want to work with somebody like Howard Rourke that he would be uh, unyielding and uh, not a great part of a team but again it's a very kind of stylized and idealized notion of what it means to be a creative person and not listen to anyone else and not uh, value the op opinions of others now the um, novel came out and then the movie came out a few years after that and it stars Gary Cooper and as we look at this do you want to stand alone against the whole world there's no place for originality in architecture nobody can improve on the buildings of the past one can only learn to copy them we've tried to teach you the accepted historical styles you refuse to learn you won't consider anybody's judgment but your own. You insist on designing buildings that look like nothing ever built before. The school has no choice but to expel you. It's my duty as your dean to say you'll never become an architect. You can't hope to survive unless you learn how to compromise. Now watch me. In just a few short years, I'll shoot to the top of the architectural profession. Because I've got to give the public what it wants. You'll never get anywhere. So you want to work for Henry Cameron, huh? Oh, I know he was a great architect 30 years ago, but he fought for your modern architecture and he's done for now. What will you get out of it? Why do you want to work for me? You're selling out to ruin yourself, you know that, don't you? I ought to throw you out of here right now before it's too late. I, I wish I'd done this at your age. Oh, why did you have to come to me? I'm perfectly happy with the drooling dolts I've got. I don't want any fool visionaries starving around here. You're an egotist. You're impertinent. You do serve yourself. Twenty years ago, I'd have punched your face for the greatest of pleasure. You're coming to work for me tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. No, 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 now leave these here. Now get out. Wait, what's your name? Howard Rourke. We can see that uh, there are many different iterations of the Fountainhead, many different um, uh, editions and many people have read the Fountainhead but I when people tell me that they've read the Fountainhead you know I'm quick to caution that that's not necessarily what modern architectural practice is like and so people get an idea from the Fountainhead that the only way to be an architect is to be a designer first of all and by yourself and uh, not working with others and not um, 
utilizing the opinions of others but really trying to you know kind of do it all yourself and it really is the notion of the star architect and I don't know how much of that is actual reality because even the people that the media would say are star architects have huge firms and employ many people um, the movie uh, you know many people have talked about remaking this movie but um, the original movie is uh, quite stark in its contrast to modern uh, dramas and um, it's a quite a harsh portrayal not at the time but just um, now looking back it appears to be a pretty harsh portrayal of someone who's quite stubborn and rigid and, and not really willing to compromise now the book idealizes that uh, idea of not being willing to compromise but again it's not really in keeping with kind of modern architectural practice so let's look at uh, another version of the portrayal of the star architect so um, this was on a 2005 episode of The Simpsons and this is the first time an architect had been featured on The Simpsons as themselves so this is Frank Gehry and he was on The Simpsons as himself you know doing his own voice and kind of um, poking fun at all of the talk of some of his models looking like they were just kind of accidental crumpled up pieces of paper and Marge Simpson writes to him and asks to have him design a concert hall for Springfield and he kind of rejects this idea and crumples up her letter and throws it on the ground and that's this image in the upper right corner and then kind of gets this idea and says oh this that would be a great um, concert hall and again making reference to Walt Disney Concert Hall that he designed in Los Angeles and then he presents his idea to the town and it actually gets built but uh, the town quickly loses interest in it as a concert hall and only attends one performance so um, you know there are all these references to Frank Gehry in the media through this episode and in the end uh, it turns into a prison so there's kind of this interesting image of um, these curving forms and um, you know all of the metal panels and the towers are added in and he the architect ends up buying it and um, turning it into this prison so um, kind of a funny portrayal of of modern architectural culture um, but it also speaks to the idea of the star architect as maybe the only reference or representation that most people have of what architects do and so uh, you know most architects would look to something like this and say well that's not realistic you know all of the people who go through architecture school are not all going to be singular designers and you know become almost celebrities in their own right that's not really uh, most people's goal but um, if that's the only point of reference you have then maybe you think that's all architects do or that they're all designers and all famous okay so that's kind of the first archetype and you you will hear that idea of the star architect um, much you know discussed in the media and certainly in architectural circles um, the next main archetype we look at is the house designer and I put the house designer on here because I think there's kind of a prevailing idea in popular culture that if you're an architect that you must have either designed your own house 
you're in the process of designing your own house or you really want to design your own house kind of from scratch. And while that's true in many cases, uh, it's not necessarily financially feasible, first of all, for architects to be able to do that. Um, or, you know, just pragmatically feasible. Uh, but it does have some kernels of truth in that many architects as they're starting out are not really able to get clients and kind of do the projects that they want to do and so they tend to experiment with their own house. This is a kind of a common thread in many architects careers is that either they experiment on their own house or uh, the house of a family member and the house is kind of a good starting point in terms of scale to be able to work out ideas on you know formal design issues on a house um, but we see this played out in this movie the house sitter or house sitter with Steve Martin and uh, it's a fairly accurate portrayal in some ways because he is at a big firm he's not the boss he's pretty far down the totem pole in terms of his career and where he's at in the firm but he really wants to you know do certain things design wise but he's just kind of doing these office buildings that they're just pumping out over and over and he's really doing the same thing so Mosby, 11 o'clock. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Mosby. Congratulations on another beautiful job. Thank you, Marty. I think everyone has a right to feel proud. Absolutely. You know, I don't know if it's the uh, champagne talking here or not, but I want to say your leadership on this has been an inspiration to all of us on the project, and I, and I hope I've not embarrassed you. Not at all, Charlie. Congratulations. Very good job. Thank you. Uh, right. I don't know if you know Davis here from the firm. He's, uh, Davis? Uh, Mr. Mosby? Uh, the, the building. <laughs> wow. It's there. Yes? Uh, you know that Boston Bank building you designed years ago? I have stood on the sidewalk for hours absorbing that structure. It still surprises me. Thank you, Davis. Don't you think we should be going for that kind of originality instead of these same designs over and over, this, this uh, cookie-cutter architecture? Don't you feel sometimes like we're just going through the motions? We are the largest architectural firm in New England. Evidently, some people like what we do. What are you insane? Why didn't you just kick him in the balls and tell me his ugly children? I thought he'd appreciate a, a fresh point of view. Why would you think that? He's the boss. He um, designs and has built uh, this house, and it also makes reference to how that was a financially terrible idea for him to do that. And uh, that's one of the most realistic portrayals I've ever seen, where uh, <clears throat> his family and his parents are kind of getting on him because he shouldn't have taken out all these mortgages and all these loans to build this house and he's going to have to sell it because he can't really afford to even keep it let alone having had already built it um, but he also is describing the house to someone and sketches it on the napkin that they're looking at in a restaurant and so uh, this is that um, image on the upper left hand corner and that's pretty realistic too I think if someone was talking about this house they had designed they'd probably just grab a pen and take your napkin away from you and start sketching away um, <clears throat> the other thing that uh, it shows is um, you know people or architects do tend to want to flesh out some ideas and a lot of times you cannot really do that unless you build something. Um, you know, you can design things all day long on paper or models, but you really learn so much, especially early on in your career, by uh, being on a job site and, and actually getting something built. Okay, another house designer that pops up is uh, a character that Richard Gere plays in the movie Intersection. And um, in this movie, he's actually an extremely successful architect. He's portrayed as an architect, and he would probably even be considered a kind of a star architect in uh, this movie. He is um, 
a partner with his wife, who's played by Sharon Stone, and she's also a designer, kind of architect. It's not quite apparent, um, but she's kind of the uh, business brains behind their firm, and their firm's very successful. But he has this idea to build this house, and he's bought this piece of property, and um, so he's kind of obsessing throughout the movie about uh, how this this house is going to get built and how it's going to be designed and he takes this model that he's looking at here he takes it out to the site and kind of turns it around and uh, that's pretty realistic too if you know you've worked with an architect or you've seen architects in action they're going to constantly go out to the site and kind of imagine what could potentially be there. He never actually builds it, um, so all different kinds of things happen in the movie, but uh, it's kind of this running thread throughout the movie that he, you know, is changing it and designing it and wants to get it just right, but in wanting to get it just right, it never actually happens. Uh, another more famous uh, house designer, perhaps, is um, the character of Mike Brady, the dad of the Brady Bunch, and um, many, you know, people were influenced by this TV series because uh, he designed their house, and it was definitely of the style of the time. It was kind of a mid-century, split-level, uh, ranch-style house in California. And, you know, you can even see the steps going down into his office. This is his home office. And, you know, many TV and movie portrayals of architects of this time, they weren't really doing anything other than they had their drafting table set up and T-square and triangles and things like that laid out. So um, it was kind of like signaling, like, hey, I'm doing some real work here. Uh, who knows what Mr. Brady was actually designing that whole time, but um, we see just a couple of episodes where his office is shown, and this is a little bit of a fuzzy image, but in the background, it's actually a sketch of his house. So you can see kind of like the carport of his house up in his office, and the office actually looks just like a wood paneled trailer so um, it might explain why he spent so much time in his home office um, and this is early on so later on I think they put him in a more proper office and he has a nice fake diploma from a non-existent architecture school in the background Okay, this is uh, the third archetype that we look at that's per portrayed a lot in the um, media and popular culture is the romantic male ideal architect. And we see this kind of repeated over and over. And, uh, you know, often we see where uh, in a movie or a TV show or even literature, more modern literature, where they'll say, okay, um, we need a character that is uh, educated and um, creative and hopefully sensitive and, um, you know, the list kind of goes on and on and they end up being an architect in um, that movie or TV show, even though there are not that many architects uh, in general. Um, Mindy Kaling, the actor and writer, um, she jokes that there are only about nine people in the world who are architects and one of them is her dad because her dad actually is an architect. Uh, but she also says that none of them look like Patrick Dempsey because this portrayal of male romantic ideal architects um, is is pretty common in um, movies especially. So the first one that we look at is um, Sleepless in Seattle. Tom Hanks's character is a 
widower. He's an architect who designed his own uh, house in Seattle, and it's kind of a house boat floating house. And of course, it's very nice and modern. And <clears throat> he is uh, raising his young son on his own, and yet still finds lots of time to design many buildings and uh, be the principal of his own firm, presumably. So um, again, kind of an idealized uh, male ideal. And we talk about the male ideal because uh, the female architect is portrayed in a much different light if, if ever she is portrayed, but not necessarily as the romantic ideal. Um, there's also a scene in this movie where um, Meg Ryan's character is trying to look up uh, this character's biography and finds two people of the same name and one is a convicted felon and one's an architect and so obviously the architect is uh, more prized but you know whenever they're depicting an architect in movies typically in this romantic idealized kind of way they're portrayed as being extremely successful um, financially stable which may or may not be the case with actual architects um, and they typically have a lot more free time than than actual architects um, the next one we look at is, is much more realistic actually. This is um, in uh, 500 Days of Summer. Um, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character is trained as an architect but is actually working at a greeting card company. And this is, you know, pretty true to the time, kind of a recession era movie. Um, but again, is, you know, depicted as this kind of idealized creative character that can't help but sketch out his ideas because they're just coming out of him in his apartment um, and eventually at the end is interviewing for architectural positions. But we see this played out a lot in kind of creative uh, character portrayals that the architect is um, you know, kind of constantly creating, that can be definitely true to life. Um, you know, see architects with their sketchbooks or cameras or, you know, pen in hand and are just constantly kind of doodling and um, thinking of new ideas or ways of representing things. And so um, this is kind of an interesting portrayal, especially of someone who's not currently working, but uh, could be and should be. Um, another one that we see is in Love Actually, Liam Neeson's character as an architect, and this is one of those kind of romantic interest characters that's almost an architect of convenience. Um, he, again, is a widower. You might see a theme played out, raising his young stepson. Uh, all of these male characters are available um, and uh, their, you know, um, creative side is definitely highlighted but again they seem to have a lot of time on their hands to um, do whatever it is that they want to do and um, architecture just kind of fits in on the side which again m probably would not be the case. Architects tend to work long hours, uh, tend to work a lot on projects, especially when there are deadlines, and may or may not get uh, financially compensated for that. So most of these characters live in pretty um, beautiful accommodations and, um, you know, their job is definitely convenient to their life. Another one of these, the perfect example of this is in Three Men and a Baby. Tom Selleck um, is one of the men who uh, has been uh, chosen or I guess 
accidentally gets a baby to raise, but uh, is an architect who lives in an extremely expensive apartment in New York City uh, on the edge of Central Park and, you know, has the air of success and definitely um, has no trouble uh, financially, it appears in the movie, and um, has a lot of leisure time and available time to do other things. So, again, maybe not the most accurate portrayal, but definitely an idealized, romanticized, romanticized version. Again, a single man and um, available. Um, in uh, the 1991 movie Jungle Fever, Wesley Snipes portrays uh, an architect, and this is one of the few um, that I can think of where there is an architect of color, and um, this is a Spike Lee movie, and so because the movie is specifically dealing with issues of race, I think it's pretty significant that uh, he plays an architect. And there's some very realistic scenes in the movie where he's worked at the firm for a long time and asked to become a partner, and the partners don't want to make him a partner quite yet. And, um, you know, he kind of quits in protest. And uh, I think many kind of mid career architects run up against that challenge um, of, you know, not quite partnering up as they would say, uh, in their own firm or in the firm they've been working at and are faced with either going out on their own or, um, you know, potentially staying. Um, but this is another one where he uh, is still, even though he's a married character, he's still kind of portrayed in that romantic uh, role. Um, especially in his um, office environment. Okay, this is Indecent Proposal. Woody Harrelson is uh, an architect in this movie, and this is kind of another recession-era depiction, a little bit more realistic because he's kind of in and out of a job. He gets a job teaching to kind of fill in the gaps financially. Uh, he and his wife have bought some land that he designed a house for, but they're, they lose the land because they can't financially hang on to it. Um, but he is, you know, kind of the romanticized central character um, who kind of wins out his uh, love interest over Robert Redford, who is, you know, a multimillionaire and... Uh, you know, the, the architect wins out in the end. Great architecture is only going to come from your passion, and even that won't assure you a job. Louis Kahn died in a men's room in Penn Station, and for days no one claimed the body. Look at that. Is that beautiful? The money men did not weep because the great ones are impossible to deal with. They're a pain in the ass because they know that if they do their jobs properly, if they just this once get it right, they can actually lift the human spirit, take it to a higher place. What is this? A brick. Good. What else? A weapon. <laughs> <laughs> Louis Kahn said even a brick wants to be something. A brick wants to be something. Aspires. You've been a common 
Ordinary brick wants to be something more than it is. It wants to be something better than it is. And that is what we must be. About with a tilty desk and a big ruler? No, it's not. can discuss other things, you know, uh, architecture. <laughs> you are very knowledgeable. I'm, uh, I'm also an architect. <laughs> I'm an architect. <laughs> I'm an architect. <laughs> I'm an architect. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I don't see architecture coming from you. What do you design? Uh, railroads. Uh. I thought engineers do that. They can. <laughs> what do you want to do when you grow up? I've been telling people that I'd like to be an architect. <laughs> Besides, Stephen Corrin has the highest of aspirations. He wants to be an architect. He's into architecture. Hey, just like you pretend to be. Why couldn't you make me an architect? You know I always wanted to pretend that I was an architect. Let me be the architect. I can do it. I, can do it. I suppose you could be an architect. I never said that I was the architect. Just something else. Right. That thing is higher than architect. That thing is higher than architect. Okay, the fourth archetype that I want to look at is the aspirational ideal and so you see this a lot this is kind of a cartoonish portrayal of an aspirational um, architect um, this is George Costanza in uh, the television series Seinfeld and he has kind of this constant running bit where he wants to be an architect and he wants to fake like he's an architect and tell people he's an architect and constantly lies to people that he's an architect because he thinks it has a certain amount of cachet and it allows people to see him in a different light and um, you know he has kind of this famous line that he keeps saying is you know nothing's higher than architect like that's that's just as good as you can do as far as um, a profession so it's kind of a funny portrayal but um, it shows the idealized nature of what people believe the architecture profession to be because you know it sounds good it sounds good enough to fake like you're an architect it seems impressive to people and yet they probably don't know what it is that architects do or you know kind of the generally held belief of what architects do, do is not uh, all that accurate um, since uh, you know people tend to think that it's uh, like super financially successful and you know all kinds of things but this is definitely a funny kind of recurring gag on um, Seinfeld um, another time when we see this like an aspirational architect where it's basically a, a fake fraudulent architect is in uh, there's something about Mary uh, Matt Dillon's character um, hears that uh, Cameron Diaz's character would like to date an architect and so he pretends to be an architect and there's a very funny scene where he pretends to talk about architecture and uses architectural jargon and vocabulary in a way that is uh, uh, pretty hilarious but um, also shows you know it's like an idealized profession almost like doctor or lawyer where it doesn't really show kind of the ins and outs of daily life in those professions but um, you know it's it sounds good to other people and it sounds like something that is successful and impressive okay and then the last one that we look at is the female now 
it's not to say that there are that many female architects portrayed in the media, but um, the few times that we do see them, they are not portrayed in that same romantic male ideal way. Um, so one that we'll look at, and this is a photograph of it here, um, is in the movie One Fine Day, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer plays a single mother who is an architect, and um, she has some kind of catastrophes that befall her that are very realistic and probably, uh, you know, all too familiar to many architects. Um, you know, she has a, a model disaster. She has kind of a run-in with her boss. She has to take her child to work with her because she can't find a sitter. These are all very realistic and uh, probably all too common um, situations that the romantic male ideal would not find themselves in, likely. Um, that there would be issues of child care depicted and, um, you know, the glass ceiling and, you know, other disasters. So pretty realistic in terms of its um, depiction of kind of day-to-day -day life as an architect. I don't make any noise in the office. I have a really important meeting, okay? Oh. Yeah. Another one that is not so realistic but is kind of important in its um, portrayal of a female architect especially at the time is um, on Family Ties the television series and the mother of the family Elise Keaton uh, was an architect and they rarely showed her at work and so a couple of times they showed her at work but most of the scenes of the show were at home and so they would talk about her as an architect and you you rarely saw her you know kind of doing anything related to architecture they, they would just kind of uh, make reference to it and here's one of the few times that you see her at work and so again they've got a drafting table but there's just kind of some piles of papers on it and um, you know I think they did try and make a good faith effort to at least uh, portray it in a way that was um, maybe semi-realistic but it's not so much the realistic depiction as it is just having a female architect as a character at that time uh, and that was I think that's the more important thing <laughs> 